Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Yeah, here we are just a few days before Christmas. I think it's also very appropriate that we uh, give a big uh, thank you to John Cantu and all of our musicians for leading us in the last few weeks in music. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, too, want to extend an uh, invitation to come for a Christmas Eve service, uh, either the 4.30 or the 6 o'clock. It'll be about a 45-minute time of just a quiet reflection, and we'll sing some Christmas carols together, share communion, and uh, I think I've got a story I'd like to tell you, a Christmas story, and it'll be a great time to connect with people that maybe you haven't seen in a while, so come and join us and invite a friend. Oh, speaking of that, right outside, right when you head out these doors, before you come to the Christmas tree, there's a table with a few more invitation cards. Uh, and on the, on the one side, it's an invitation for Christmas Eve candlelight. So take those on the way out if you'd like to invite friends, neighbors, co-workers. It'd be a great opportunity to kind of plant the gospel in somebody's life. Well, this holiday season, we've been getting acquainted with, with some of the original members of the first welcoming party at the birth of Jesus. And our goal is not just to learn history. Our goal has been to discover what were the heart qualities these people possessed that, that just somehow made their hearts open, that made their hearts receptive to welcome and to accept Jesus Christ into the world. And our desire is to uh, find out what these qualities are and see if we can develop over this month as we're heading toward Christmas, to develop these same qualities in our hearts so that we can once again welcome Christ anew into our hearts and into our lives. Now, so far, we've looked at two of the uh, original welcoming party. We looked at Joseph, and from Joseph, we learned you have to have an obedient heart. And then we looked at Mary, and we learned from Mary, you must have a, a servant's heart, willing to serve the purposes of God. Well, today we're going to look at another group, and that is the shepherds. Uh, as their story begins, they have, they have hearts, all right, but their hearts are filled with fear. But by the end of their story, a major radical transformation has taken place in their heart. They literally have moved from fearful hearts to joyful hearts. I would like to know how that happens. So let me read to you the story of the shepherds and then we will answer that question. How do you make that journey from fearful to joyful? Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. Some translations say he is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, now watch, no longer afraid, but what? Glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Quite a story. 
Now, what causes a transformation from a fearful to a joyful heart? My guess is most of us in this room today could use the same kind of heart transplant uh, from fearful to joyful. I don't have to mention to you guys, we, we live in fearful times. Everywhere you look, there are things going on in our world that create fear. From global anxiety in the Middle East to national concerns of terrorism to, to personal worries. Turn on the news any day of the week and there's one more reason to be afraid. We've all, we've all had enough fears to make a list and we don't need to check this one twice. We live in a fearful world. So back to these shepherds. What was it, what happened that changed these guys from fearful hearts to joyful hearts? And can we somehow make the same journey? Can we somehow have the same experience so that our fears will not suddenly just be erased? No, we live in a real fallen world. But how, how can we make a transformation so that our fears are somehow eclipsed by joy? From the story of the shepherds, we're going to learn what changes a fearful heart to a joyful heart. And I'll let the cat out of the bag now. The, the secret is actually found in two verses that we just read a moment ago. Verses 10 and 11. Let me read it to you again. But the angel said to them, that is to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Okay, what's the, what's the message that's going to bring joy? Here it is. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. All right, what is it going to take for us to have joyful hearts this Christmas? According to the angels, here's what it takes. Number one, accept Jesus as your Savior. Accept Jesus as your Savior. Very interesting, of all the things the angels could have said first, the very first thing they said was, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important if you're honest. Are you honest enough today to admit what the rest of us already know, that you are a sinner? You see, we're all sinners. The Bible makes it clear all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, if you would like to engage in a meaningless, fruitless debate, we can talk about degrees of sinfulness, if you would like. We can, we can debate about who's the greatest sinner and who's a less sinner. And on a scale of 1 to 100, where are you on the scale of, of being a sinner? That's kind of like dead people at the cemetery arguing about who's the deadest. <laughs> yeah, I died in 1980, you died in 1950. You're deader than me. Kind of ridiculous. You know, dead is dead. Ephesians 2, we're all dead in our sins and trespasses. We're all dead. We're all sinners. And the one thing every sinner needs, every sinner, is a savior. According to the angels, Jesus Christ came to be our savior. He came to die on a cross. He came to, to pay the penalty for our sin, to pick up the tab that we owed. As Sean said earlier, to do something for us that none of us deserved. It was pure love, pure grace that caused him to do it. Now, why is this important? Well, I put this in your notes, and I hope you'll remember this. If you have an unforgiven heart, then you have a fearful heart. It's true. If you have not been forgiven of your sins, you have fear in your heart, and for good reason, because you stand to face the judgment of God. 
But the good news of Christmas is, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He says, I will die on the cross. I will pay the penalty you deserve so that your sins can be forgiven. As we used to sing, they can be washed white as snow. White as snow. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Very important that we not let another Christmas go by without making that decision without accepting him for who he is and what he wants to be in our lives. Namely, the Savior of the world and the forgiver of our sins. An amazing thing happens, my friend, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Where fear once resided, joy moves in. And you will have a joy, no matter what circumstances may going, be going around the world or in your neighborhood or in your own personal life. It doesn't matter. That kind of joy will, every time, eclipse the painful, difficult circumstances of your life. Because you will be able to say for the rest of your life, you know, it really doesn't matter what happens in the world. It really doesn't happen, ultimately, what happens in my life. Hey, someday I'm going to die and my sins are forgiven, and I've got a home in heaven. You know what you call that? Joy. Joy. If you want a joyful heart, accept Jesus, the angels say, as your Savior. Now, the angels didn't stop there, so neither shall we. Here's the second thing we need to do, and that is, number two, accept Jesus as your king. Accept Jesus as your king. Now, I realize in the in the angel's actual words, it says, a Savior is born to you. He is the Messiah, or he is the Christ. Now, what does that have to do with a king? Well, the word Messiah, and as a matter of fact, I put this in your notes. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word, and the word Christ, or Christos, is the Greek translation of that. But in English, it means the anointed one. So when you look at those three languages, Messiah, Christ, anointed one, we're saying the same thing in three different languages. You got that? Okay. That's why your translations will say Christ, Messiah, or anointed one. It's just translating it differently. Now, the reason this is important as we think of Jesus being the king is this was the term, Messiah, this was the term used throughout the Old Testament to identify the, the king of Israel. Because when the king of Israel would come and would begin his reign, he would be anointed by one of the prophets. So a prophet would take a, a flask of oil and would pour it on the new king's head. He would be the anointed one. Now, anytime you see that in the Old Testament, if you had your Hebrew Bibles available to you, it would use the word Messiah, that, that they would Messiah the new king, okay? They would anoint the new king. Now, why is this important? Back to our story with the shepherds. The shepherds' fearful hearts turned joyful when they discovered who this little baby was going to be. This baby was none other than the long-awaited king of Israel. The Old Testament prophets had predicted the coming of this king. They'd been doing it for centuries. And now these shepherds would be introduced in very short time to the long-awaited Messiah, Christ, anointed one, king of Israel. Now this king would be different. This king would be in the lineage of David. This king would rule with justice and mercy. In fact, his kingdom would be like none other kingdom before or after. You know, a couple weeks ago, we looked at Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. This describes, let me read it to you. This describes who Jesus would be. He will be, a, he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne. See that? Kingly language. The throne of of his father David. So in the lineage of David, the Christ would come 
and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Listen, King David's kingdom came to an end. Solomon's kingdom came to an end. Josiah's kingdom came to an end. Something different, something unique would be attached to this new king. His kingdom would be forever. There would be no end. So here's my question to you. Have you accepted Jesus as your king? Now, see, kingly language is hard for Americans because when we think king, we think, oh, yeah, that's that guy we rebelled against over there in England. We rebelled against that king. And so when you grow up in a democracy, we have difficulty understanding monarchy. We have trouble understanding language having to do with a throne and a king. But the bottom line is when you live in the monarchy and the king is on the throne, then you follow what the king says. So have you accepted Jesus as your king? Is he reigning on the throne of your heart? If not, you're going to live a fearful life. Why? Because if he's not on your throne, chances are you're on the throne. And if you're running your life, that is a fearful thing. But Jesus Christ wants to be king. He wants to rule and reign on the throne of your heart. If you want a joyful heart, accept Jesus as your king. If you're not, you're missing out on the joyful reign of the forever and ever king named Jesus. So accept uh, Jesus as your king. Now there's, there's a third message from the angels that we really need to understand. Number three, accept Jesus as your Lord. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Now, the word Lord in Greek is the word kurios is a very interesting word because in the Roman world, the word kurios would be the word reserved to refer to the emperor of Rome, okay? And so the, the people would call the emperor, whether it be Claudius or Augustus, whoever the emperor was at the time, the Greek term used to describe him would be he is our Curios, he is our Lord. Do you understand how radical it is for the angels to come along and say, you're about to meet the new Curios. You're about to meet the new Lord. Do you realize that what that angel said to those shepherds was treason? There is a rival king. There is a rival to the throne. There is a new Lord in town. Radical message. The word Lord simply means the one in charge, the one in control. So I ask you, is Jesus your Lord? Have you relinquished the control of your life to Jesus as Lord? If not, why not? Well, I like to run my own life. I like to be in control. I, yeah, as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? Uh, grandma May was my grandma on my mother's side and uh, after my granddad died she she lived alone for probably 20 years uh, long before she should have been living alone and worse than that she drove about 10 years beyond her driving ability and uh, she scared us to death she lived about uh, 15 miles from where I, I, I lived and so when I was a kid, Grandma May would come in every Saturday to go shopping in town, and she'd drop by the house, and she'd head home. And so we got to see Grandma May just about every Saturday. My grandma, she drove a Plymouth Fury 3. Anybody remember the Plymouth Fury 3? What those were, they were actually tanks from World War II, <laughs> and they, they just put a, a you know, new body type on it. I mean, those were tanks. And my grandmother drove it like a tank. Every Saturday, there would be a new dent. 
a new scratch, a new dean. Every Saturday. We'd walk her out to the car. And I remember my mom or dad would say, Grandma May, where did that one come from? I don't know where that came from. Where'd that scratch come from? I bet somebody opened their door in the parking lot and, and hit mine. Well, we, we learned the, the answer to the mystery when we went out to her house one time. And she had a single car garage. And we noticed on the frames on both sides, white paint, just white paint and big gouges and nicks. And um, she, she just had trouble kind of hitting that hole whenever she was pulling in. The longer Grandma May lived, the more dents, the more scratches, the more wrecks she had. So let me ask you about your life. Are you learning that the, the longer you live, the more dents you make in your life? The more scrapes, the more scratches? Any, anybody have any major wrecks while you're driving your life? And see, the tendency is to say as we're driving our own life, uh, Oh, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm a good driver. I'm running my life really well. It's all these other people who have problems. They keep running into me. I'm not the one destroying relationships. It's all these crazy people at work. It's my family. You know, If my spouse would change, then I wouldn't have any dents in my life. Really. How honest do you want to be? So we're driving our life down the road and there's scrapes and fenders are off and the bumper's dragging and sparks are flying. And we can't see out the windshield because the wipers haven't worked in years. We don't know where we're going. We don't know where we've been. We can't learn from our past because, yeah, we knocked off the mirror sometime back. And, and the engine is smoking and steam is coming out from under the hood, and we're driving and going, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing just fine. I'm running my life just right. I really don't need any help. Oh, really? How honest do you want to be? Surely God could do a better job controlling our lives since he is the one who made us, since he made us, don't you think he probably knows what makes us tick? Don't you think he probably knows you inside and out? Uh, don't you think he could probably get you down the road of life in better condition if you'll go ahead and uh, kind of slip over to the side and let him be Lord? Let him be the one in control. Give him the steering wheel. He made us. He made us. He knows what makes us tick. So in your notes, just a simple challenge. If we will turn the controls over to him, he will help us make joyful sense of our lives. See, I'm convinced that some of you are not having joy in your life because the joy giver is not in control of your lives. It's really difficult for Jesus to pour joy into your life uh, if he's outside the car. Allow him to come into your heart. Allow him to bring joy and to make joyful sins out of the rest of your life. Accept Jesus as your Lord. Hey, are, are there any ichthologists in the room? Show of hands, ich ichthologist. You're, some of you are looking, you're Googling ichthologist right now, aren't you? Uh, I'll save you the time. Uh, an ichthologist is a person who studies fish. Uh, the word ichthologist comes from the Greek word ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish. Now, some of you may be aware that in the first century, the, the fish became a symbol for Christianity. In fact, tradition says that when Christians in the first century were being persecuted, one of the ways they would um, secretly identify each other was using the sign of the fish. Some of you right now may have on some jewelry 
Christian jewelry, and it's uh, the sign of a fish. You know, it's like this and then this. You know, it's that fish sign with the tail at the end. And according to tradition, it was kind of like a secret handshake with Christians. So if you're on the road and you run into somebody and you're visiting with them, you could very nonchalantly uh, take a stick and you would draw one half of the fish in the dirt. And the other person, if they were a Christian, would take the stick and they would complete the other side to make the sign of a fish. And the minute that happened, you knew you were in the presence of a fellow Christian. And so the early Christians saw the fish as one of the early signs. You know, we had the cross, but also the fish, one of the early symbols. Now, one of the interesting things about the fish symbol is that it's actually an acrostic. Uh, and so I put it in your notes. If you look at the bottom down there, the word ichthus is an acrostic. And here's what each of those letters stand for. You notice it's I-C-H-T-H-U-S in English. And here's the way it works. The first one is Jesus. Kind of like in Spanish, Jesus. In Greek, it's Jesus, and that's Jesus. Christos is Christ. Theu, sounds like theos. Theu is God's. Huios is son. And Soter is savior. So make sure you get those written down. Jesus is Jesus. Christos, Christ. Theu is God's. Huios is son. Soter is savior. Does everybody see that? And that's where the, the idea of, of the ichthus in the early, early centuries of Christianity, they would see this as an acrostic, a symbol, a secret handshake, because that's what they believed about Jesus Christ. Now, I've got to tell you, I think it's fair to say that the shepherds, in addition to herding sheep, I think they were also ichthologists. You see, when they found Jesus in the manger, they found more than just another baby. They found the ichthus of God. They found Jesus, the Christ, God's Son, Savior of the world. And finding Jesus, guys, finding Jesus is what transformed these fearful shepherds into joy-filled shepherds. And finding Jesus this Christmas will do the same for you. Will you accept Jesus as your Savior, your King, and your Lord? I've always loved the words that Harriet Hine penned, entitled, If There Had Been No Christmas Morn. If there had been no Christmas morn, no Christ child in a manger born, no shepherds watching in the night, no angel song, no star of light, then there would be no hope today for this old world where sin holds sway. No peace for souls weighed down with sin. No deep abiding joy within. No burdens lifted by his grace. No strength to run life's weary race. No sorrows eased. No tempest quelled. No fears dispersed. No doubts dispelled. No song of praise. No answered prayer, no loving Lord to guide and care. But friend, there was a Christmas morn when Christ, the Son of God, was born. Oh, hallelujah, praise his name. Hope lives today because he came. Develop a joyful heart. Develop a joyful heart like the shepherd and you will be well on your way to having a wonderful heart for Christmas. I want to invite the musicians to come, and I want to pray for the rest of you. If you would just bow, and in this time of quiet reflection, Christmas just a few days away, when we celebrate the coming of Jesus, not just an ordinary birth, not just an ordinary baby. We celebrate the coming of a Savior 
the coming of a king, the coming of a Lord. But before we leave today, we need to change one word. We need to change that word to my Savior, my King, and my Lord. Are you ready today to make that decision that will change your life forever? Sure, all the fears of life will not disperse, but the wonderful joy of Christmas has the power to eclipse them all. Invite Jesus Christ now into your heart to be all of this and so much more so that Christmas, Christmas will find its true meaning in your heart. One wintry night came a great light from heaven above, God's gift of love. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. But what can I give him? I will give him my heart. Amen.